Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes to talk you through the paving bill, the preparation bill. Um, the preparation bill is a two-clause bill. It's more a political gesture than anything that the government needs to proceed with HS2. There has been an agreement with the Labour Party, so the Labour Party uh, will be voting for the preparation bill, and it will enable the government to be able to say that Parliament has supported HS2, and therefore people like me are standing in the way of progress, in other words. The second reading is on Wednesday. It's after the statement by the Chancellor on the spending review, so that will take all the news on Wednesday, and it will follow on with second reading, and thereafter also a couple of changes to the way in which the hybrid bill process will proceed. I've had reassurances on those. It's simply because I think Hillary's right. It was 40,000 pages last year when I was looking at it in, in the um, Cabinet Legislative Committee. It's now 55,000 pages minimum for the hybrid bill. And therefore, these provisions are going to allow the government to table all these papers electronically. Now, that might mean that it's not accessible to each and every one of you, but believe you me, it's a very good thing to have because we'll be able to search those documents electronically. We'll be able to navigate our way around those documents more easily, and I think that's absolutely essential when we're dealing with a hybrid bill that will be as large as this one when it comes through. Back to the paving bill. The paving bill will have a second reading and will go through, undoubtedly. I'm tabling a reasoned amendment. I don't know whether it will chosen, but it declines to give us a reading to this bill until there's more details on the route and until there's a financial cap. This bill only relates to money, so it will not go through the same stages as it has to go through in the House of Commons, in the House of Lords. The House of Lords is not allowed to discuss or look in the detail of a money bill, so it can only have um, just a debate on that bill effectively, so it's a commons only process. Many of us thought this bill was going to actually contain provision to enter people's property because HS2 is having difficulty on access to do the surveys for the environmental studies. Of course, if it did contain that as a clause, it would no longer be a money bill, and it would mean that that bill would take much longer because it would have to go through a full process in the House of Lords and then come back to the House of Commons. It will get second reading on Wednesday and the government will be able to say that Parliament backs HS2 after Wednesday. That's the bad news. It will then go into committee stage, and at the moment, although I haven't seen the details, it's anticipated there will be eight committee sessions upstairs, not on the floor of the House, and it will comprise four where evidence is taken, I don't know who from at this stage, or if indeed that is going to be the case, and then four where amendments to this bill will be considered. Can I just uh, say a big thank you um, to Ray, who's already given me some, um, some clues as to uh, what I should be looking for, bearing in mind his experience with legislation on the Olympics. Um, I'm going to make a, um, a fairly long and detailed speech uh, on uh, the second reading. Whether I will be on the committee stage of that bill, I do not know. I've actually applied to go on the committee stage of the bill so that I can propose amendments to the bill. It's only members of the committee on the bill when it goes upstairs that will be able to push and propose amendments. So in fact, Caroline Spelman and I have both volunteered uh, to go on the bill because we thought if two ex-cabinet ministers were on that bill, it would actually show that the government was taking it seriously and it would ensure that those amendments are put forward. I don't think many of the amendments that we are already working on are in all likelihood going to be accepted by the government at committee stage. But that doesn't mean to say that we will not be able to make our argument and put it out there in public. And I think it's essential that we do at this stage uh, because I think it gives us another opportunity to show not only that there are alternatives to this project, still which government should be considering, but if, God forbid, it goes ahead, we get the best compensation that we've discussed in detail here and the best mitigation for the Chilterns and for our community. And can I just say, one of the ways in which we've been looking at it, um, and in which um, the Chilterns Conservation uh, have always been looking at it, is the way they've broken up into areas, the environmental studies. And in fact, you've got to look at it holistically when we're looking at the Chilterns. 
And therefore, for example, um, my office thought we were not being affected by the design refinement consultation. In fact, when we read it and we looked at the state mandible loop and the implications for Cheshire and Amersham's, we discovered that we actually too have to make um, a response to that. But can I just pay tribute um, to David as well, because David and uh, Dominic Grieve and Steve Baker and John Berthke, the speaker, and I have been working together very closely on this project. And I now speak with the freedom of a woman being out of government. And believe you me, that liberation is fantastic. But I couldn't do the job of fighting on behalf of our constituents and the Chilterns if I didn't have people like David and Dominic still in government. Believe you me, we need our MPs inside and outside government. And uh, it's a great privilege to be able to uh, be invited into your constituency, David, thank you very much, to have an opportunity to talk about what we are doing all together. And uh, we will still continue to fight on your behalf and behalf of all our communities. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. We all know how well you kicked it locally in the county council elections. I have actually asked Chris Adams to have get reassurance from Nigel Farage this is at the election, we come out with a hand parliament. If you can have candidate have MPs, that they won't go back on their support against Stop HS2. And I wonder whether Chris Adams could actually inform us of that now. But also I'd like to say to David and Cheryl, we do appreciate what's being done, but we're still asking, it would appear that politically we are getting nowhere. We are with the major projects authority, with the National Audit Office. Other people seem to appreciate that this is a crazy scheme. And yet for some reason, the politicians, the elected politicians, we have not been able to move them at all. So I'd like Chris Adams to reply first, and then maybe David or Cheryl to comment on my feeling about our democracy. Yes, thank you for those people who voted for me, and those people who didn't vote for me, maybe next time. Anyway. It's, it is a serious situation, um, and what an excellent um, presentation, I must say, that the team have put forward to you today. Um, it is miserable. What we've got to do is, I still think we can stop it, because you know and I know that the price ticket at the moment is around about 33 billion, and then they forgot the VAT and things like that which is pretty stupid of the government. But then we all know it's probably going to be something like £70 billion. And more. And the rest. What Nigel has said, because obviously Nigel Farage is your local MEP um, in this area for the South East, we will not be going back on our word. We'll, we, we will be fighting it all the way. In the election, over the last three years, there has been certain flack thrown at um, UKIP. Number one, why would you build a HS2 line through the middle of the Chilterns? Exactly like the gentleman there said from the Chiltern Society. If you, had, if you were going to build it and you could afford it, you would put it somewhere like the M1 and then the junction off the M6. That's if you could afford it. But we are pretty skint at the moment in this country. And I agree, our politicians, I'm afraid, have let us down from all parties in the government. They've let us down like a cheap pair of braces, basically, to destroy the Chiltern Hills, families, communities, businesses. So one thing, we won't be going back on our word, and I have that. Um, there's been an email that has been sent from Wendover HS2, from Brian. He will be getting a, um, a good response um, to that message. But please don't give up. Keep fighting. Uh, and as I say, it is pretty miserable. And I will certainly do my best um, for you as your county councillor for Wendover, Holton and Stone Mandeville. Um, can I, I want to say a couple of things. I do want to say, I wanted to come to Wendover 
and say, say to people directly in front of you how I plan to go on Wednesday this week. So I'm sort of taking this head on. Um, when we had the consultation in 2011, I put my views forward you know, very strongly and at some length. That is up on the website. You know, I think a lot of people here were sent copies, so you've seen where I've come from personally on this. Once, and you know, Cheryl will remember this too when you know, she was in the government, once then the cabinet took a formal decision to press ahead with this as a policy. Those of us who were members of the government from that point on had to pursue, if we, would, if we were any of the government, we had to pursue the constituency case within the framework set out in the published ministerial code. And that means basically two things. It means, first of all, that as a minister, you cannot get involved in the government decision-taking on this. So if I was in the transport department, you know, I would have to stay right away from any decision on HS2. Thankfully, the Foreign Office means you're not actually involved in that. Um, and that's quite proper, so that the constituency, the ministerial, national interest are separated. Secondly, why a member of the government you may not, in public, uh, you know, mount an attack upon the policy of the government of which you are a member. It doesn't mean everybody in the government agrees on everything. I've, I've never come across a government of any party or combination of parties where there's complete agreement. And I suspect those who here have served on the boards of companies will you know, see a similar experience in their lives in terms of you know, as a collective board position Directors may well have dissented from that and hold strong private views to converse. But nothing stops you from uh, expressing your views very strongly with no holds barred behind closed doors, nor does anything stop you, and hasn't, from doing that or from uh, expressing views on behalf of constituents and phrased in that way in letters and speeches and so on. So that you are saying, you know, my constituents believe that this project is a complete waste of money or something, but it, it, you, you, it limits on what a minister can say publicly. Now, when it came to the, uh, the, um, this bill, um, this preparation bill, I mean, like Cheryl, I had a look at the text, and I consulted the clerks of the Commons and the research staff of the Commons Library, and they basically said, well, you know, the Department of Transport's been spending money on preparation, and on compensation for the last two years. We can't really see that new authority is needed here. Um, and it does authorise the scheme to go ahead. It doesn't authorise interference with property or with house repurchase or anything like that, anything to do with the route. Um, and what I am going to do on Wednesday is not take part in the vote, and I shall you know, be doing ministerial business, quite important ministerial business elsewhere. But um, I took the decision, I say this openly to you, that uh, you know, the other option, if I went with Cheryl, would be to resign from the government in order to do that. And that's a nuclear weapon. You know, it's something you can only do once. It's a last resort. And being in the government, as Cheryl has indicated, means I've been able to go in, sit with the Prime Minister, open out the maps of Wendover, you know, point him to Back and Lane, and to um, Ellsborough Road and the other hotspots, I've been able to get to see the Chancellor of the Exchequer, make Hillary's arguments about the property bond and the fact that actually at the end of the day if the department's arguments are right, there won't be the need for vast compensation, whereas if you persist with VPZ, everybody in the VPZ is likely to um, you know, want to take advantage of it. Um, and I, I judge at the moment the interests of people here and elsewhere in my constituency are going to be served by me remaining inside the tent, working hand in glove with Cheryl and those colleagues, those who are outside, being able to put direct to ministers in a way that Hillary and others are not allowed to do themselves as they don't get the access. The expert case that they um, make up. Now, to come, I do want to talk about Jane's point. Um, Jenny, I'm, I'm going back. Um, I think any 
AMP who represents a constituency in the Chilterns or the other areas that are really adversely affected shares that sense of frustration. Um, I would say to you two things. First of all, don't underestimate the fact that in other parts of the country uh, there are very strong political forces making the argument the other way. Birmingham City Council has been lobbying its MPs and other West Midlands MPs to say this is a great thing for Birmingham. Manchester, Leeds, local authorities, Chambers of Commerce in Northern England have been doing the same to their people. The Scots have been arguing a very similar case. So the political pressure is coming from both directions. And the other truth is about this is that very senior members of the government and of the opposition are convinced that this is in the national interest. They, they believe rightly that the UK has for too long ignored um, long-term infrastructure projects. Um, and it's trying to get, the, the whole point of what we're trying to get across is the argument that while that judgment may be right, this is not the something that needs to be done to meet the challenge of providing long-term infrastructure. So I, it is frustrating, but the, the public line is always going to stay, stay the same. It's the way government operates until it changes. And then if one day the Treasury decides this is not something that is affordable, it will suddenly flip, as happened with the London Airport site. Um, and Treasury delayed Crossrail and changed the route, you know, over about 25 years. So I think you, I would say to constituents who still you don't give up, but it is it is tough. And the reality is, as Cheryl said, there is a clear majority of people in the House of Commons who either support it or are frankly indifferent to it because their constituents don't write to them about it at all, rather than when they make huge efforts to try and get wider um, interest. But if you represent Norfolk, or Sunset, um, or no, North Wales, it doesn't figure in your post bag. And so it's not something that you really get uh, terribly concerned about, and you don't look at the detail about it. But I think Sherry will turn around. I just wanted to, to fully endorse what David said, but I also wanted to draw your attention, attention to not only the fact that the NAO report is adverse and we've not heard government's response to the National Audit Office report, and I've met with both Margaret Hodge and Amias Morse, Margaret Hodge on more than one occasion. Um, I want to see how the government is going to respond to that, because it's not helpful to call the National Audit Office a bunch of bean counters. <laughs> I've always thought them as an independent and... Uh, and, uh, and very reliable source for advice. But we've also got the situation where we've got an unresolved um, uh, judicial process going on. We have um, a very imperfect draft environmental um, uh, assessment uh, consultation, which I've not succeeded in getting the extension of time on. And we've also got the Major Projects Authority report, which was um, referred to, there's more than one of them, which the Information Commissioner on June the 6th decided that it was in the public interest for these full reports to be published. The government has 28 days in which to appeal, and I've already tabled a written question and had an answer um, that they're thinking about what they're going to do. Um, but it is interesting that the Information Commissioner believes that we need that major projects authority report in detail published. Um, I think it's fair to say the Department of Transport is always trying to pull the wool over our eyes and point us to the annual review of the Major Projects Authority report in the Cabinet Office. And I think the Cabinet Office needs to man up and uh, stop lecturing others about transparency and be a bit transparent itself. But why I wanted to get to my feet was I also wanted to point out I've been working with the New Economics Foundation. Now, this is an economics foundation that comes really from the left, I would have said, of the political spectrum. But they have been uh, very good uh, with me. And uh, they produced this report, which uh, we launched in the House of Commons last week, which is creating more value from 33 billion. Basically, it examines the why route. It looks at what the government wants to achieve in terms of economic renewal um, and greening. And it looks at the alternatives. And I, please go on the website and look at the NEF report, because it includes um, not only upgrading our railways, 
but it includes many other things, including high-speed broadband and looking at uh, active transport as well, sort of the mayor's Boris's uh, bicycle scheme in lots of other cities, etc. And it really is a very good piece of work which already looks at the alternatives, which I think the government should have looked at, Hillary, and this report just simply, um, I think, makes, uh, makes uh, a reality out of the alternatives that government should have considered before going ahead with it.